Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ken and this is the Option Series presented by Experimental Sound Studio uh, as part of their quarantine concert programming that's been going on for months now. Um, before we even start, I'd like to thank Experimental Sound Studio and everybody over there um, for all they're doing to help support music and musicians right now during the, the COVID pandem pandemic. Uh, big thanks to Gerald Cleaver, who's our guest tonight. Uh, we'll be listening to some duo music that he recorded with Brandon Lopez. Uh, we were going to present this about a month ago, and then um, we were hit with a huge storm in Chicago that was even bigger in Gary, Indiana. And Sam Clapp, who's uh, doing the tech tonight, was in Gary and going to help us from there. And like all the electricity got knocked out. So thanks to you, Gerald, for being patient um, and coming. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, great to have you here. Um, before we start talking about music, I'd just like to. Uh, remind everyone that there's a lot going on uh, socially and politically and if you can keep pushing forward with uh, communicating with each other, uh, contributing to causes you care about, demonstrating, uh, sharing information, uh, making sure you vote coming up, there's a lot going on and uh, everything people do in these regards, what's done uh, does really contribute and and I think that it's important to remember that every contribution puts the energy forward and, uh, you know, people can do what they can do. So anything that's possible has meaning. So just uh, this music that we're doing now that we're going to talk about now is in a context, uh, particularly in the United States, but all around the world. It's really in a, in a serious crisis and it's not just about COVID. It's about po politics. And uh, just wanted to mention that before we begin. Um, so, Gerald, uh, thanks for being here. Like I said, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to point out that the music that we're listening to tonight that you sent over uh, features the bassist Brandon Lopez. And I got two questions to start with. One, uh, I'm looking at your discography and your and your your biography, and you play with unbelievably great bass players. Mm -hmm. There's like an amazing history there of, uh, you know, everyone from William Parker to Joe Leandra to uh, Jean Hubert, who's going to be on the series coming up, uh, I think, next week. Brandon Lopez, of course, Chris Lightcap. There's a slew of amazing players. Um, obviously, in, let's say, the, the history of, of, of jazz and all music, actually, the relationship between a drummer and bassist is so crucial to everything about the music, uh, mm -hmm. not just the the idea that it's a foundation, but it's an integral, central part to what happens. Um, I got the two questions. One, uh, it's interesting to have it's just bass and drums. I'm super excited to, to hear this and, and feature it tonight. Was there a conscious decision to just play with Brandon? As I know you've worked with him in other contexts, uh, in like say trios and quartets, whatnot. Um, was it a practical consideration or one specific just uh, to do a duo with Brandon with a bassist? And then the other question is, um, obviously we understand that there's a real importance to this relationship and the dynamic between what you're doing and the bass player you work with. But do you feel like that is like a primary focus in terms of when you put a band together, who, what bands you'd like to play with? Because I know for me personally, of all the instrumentalists I work with in a group, the drummer is the most important one to me. Like I have to have a real tight relationship musically with that player. And then I can, it, it just, everything becomes more clear for me. So mm -hmm. my, my thing, like the other horn player, if there is one or a bassist, it's really the drummer. Uh, and I was wondering what you feel about that. Is the bass central or is it just that you have this incredible uh, lineup of players that you've worked through in your history? Uh, yeah, you know, <clears throat> it as 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 is well familiar to you. You know, personality is everything. You know, and, you know, vibe, those things fitting together uh, personally is super important to me. Yeah, you know, like uh, being on the stand and making great music and being off the stand and and uh, the relationship be becoming something different is a little weird to me so it, it it's really about personal relationship 
but uh, you know, Brandon is one of those uh, you know special players who's very singular already, and he's young. <clears throat> so you know, like, uh, to, but to answer uh, part of your question, yeah, base is super important to me. That that brings up uh, in my earliest attempts at composition. I would always come up with a baseline first, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, in thinking back, yeah, most definitely, you know, base holds like this primary position of of this this most important hub of of being a rhythmic instrument and a harmonic instrument and a melodic instrument at the same time, but and, and its primary function being overwhelmingly rhythmic so you know like i um over the course of you know these years have started feeling like i could play with 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 any type of configuration you know um and and it feels and it feels complete you mm -hmm. know so it, while you were in, while you were uh, introducing, I thought about uh, there was this great band in Detroit uh, from the drummer Leonard King and Rodney Whitaker, uh, bass player, and they called it Proportioned Orchestra. You know, so like that that's just like a typical Detroit thing. You know, <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of those in Chicago too. Just like I, I I just love the concept, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's and it, it's complete, you know. Like I and and the and the duos that we've Brandon and I have worked together a lot over these years, um, in different kinds of configurations. But I feel like one thing that uh, always is the result is this sort of uh, burrowing. Bur bur burrowing down <laughs> you know like like going going into the earth you know trying to you know th things become massive you know that's what it feels and it's fun it's nice you know um, and uh, you know um, and another answer to part of your question is if yeah, if the bass player is not holding up his or her end of the bargain, I mean that completely shuts me down. I and like I can't, uh, and I'm sure the, the 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 feeling is probably mutual. Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean by that when you say like holding up their part of the bargain? Are you talking about like a, uh, just keeping it to music? Because I agree with you, the social just, aspect is so important. But is it like a the, the rhythmic laying down the, the, the time together, the feeling, or even if it's not in a pulse, like having a rhythmic uh, agreement about where the music should go, or how do you yeah. find just I, I think it's more, uh, it has everything, of course, to do with preparedness, mm. you know, and tech and not, not technique, but uh, what, what would be another word for that? It's just simply to have to have their armor on, you know, to be ready to go, mm -hmm. you know, to bring it, really bring it. And that could be uh, down here, or it could be full blown, you know, note factory, as, <laughs> as Roscoe, like, you know. So, yeah, just that's what I mean by, mm -hmm. well, they bring, they got to bring it. Like the attitude. Like an, yeah. like an intensity, and, and the intensity doesn't have, like you said, doesn't have to be like, you know, quote unquote aggressive, but it has to be present, a real presence there. Right. You're, you're together in this. Yeah. Yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. So is the duo stuff we're going to listen to now, the, there's three pieces, and we're going to listen to them separately with some conversation in between. Uh, is this first piece got anything specific about it you want to describe, or is it... Uh, Let's just let's just listen to it and talk about it after. Yeah, no, we just went in and uh, we we never talk about what we're gonna do. 
uh, we just do it and and then uh, check it out later. So that's what we did with this. Okay, okay. Well, everyone, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is Gerald Cleaver. We're about to hear a duo performance, uh, brand new material with uh, Gerald and the bassist Brandon Lopez. Uh, thanks. Stick around, and uh, we'll be back in a little bit with some more conversation. Thank you.
Hey everybody, that was uh, Brandon Lopez who's checking in on the chat room. Hello, Brandon. It's great to hear from you too. This is Joe Cleaver. Uh, fantastic to hear you guys. Wow. Yeah, thanks. The real rapport there, man. Real yeah. rapport. So great. Um, and it's always great to hear some new music and see people playing together. It's just, uh, uh, it's, it's so vibrant, you know, and, uh, so thank you for making the, the new records. Where did, where did you record that? Is that a rehearsal space you work that, in? Or? Yeah, that's, that's my practice space. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now we have a little bit more insight into your workings. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've got right. a couple a uh, couple questions from folks who are tuning in. Uh, the first is from Alia Tori, uh, and they wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about form and structure when you improvise. Uh, are you trying to make song forms in real time, for example? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes I am, yeah. Sometimes it's very... Uh, song form structure in the way I think about my parts. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 of course, it all depends on the context. And I like to sort of eliminate what I, the way I think about the music as I, I don't, I, I feel like free music, free jazz is, is, is not descriptive enough. The way I think about it is uh, a, a, a large amount of, of uh, contexts all at once, a lot of frames of reference all at once, where, uh, you know, um, something might feel like Billie Holiday for a minute, and then it might feel like the cramps, mm. you, know, um, <laughs> you know, like, <clears throat> and then just following in my fanciful way, following that line of, of, of thought as far as it'll go. And sometimes I, 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 I like to think about it at, in terms of like superstructures, like built, like large, large ideas that last a long time, maybe, or large ideas that last a short amount of time. And I'm not even talking about dynamics. I'm talking about so like the intention of what you put out there, which manifests itself rhythmically, you know, so that I'm, I might start losing people here getting to. No, no, no. It sounds great. Uh, Please. But, you know, like there's a certain kind of dimensionality to the way I'm thinking, which is why I can say I, I like to build structures. Um, and of course, that's in the, the that's in the eye of the beholder. You know, what does that mean? What basically what that means is um, as I'm doing it, I have a coherent idea of what came before, what's going to come next, you know, like as as we get older and more experienced, I feel like we can see the playing field a little clearer and a little farther, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I say I can, uh, of course, we know what came before, but I can anticipate what can comes next and I can even shape where it goes, you know. It's it's just it's just sort of experiential premonition, you mm -hmm. know. It just comes with experience where you you know it's almost like you know the timing. You get you get more. You you just simply become more acutely aware of the timing. I feel like so so it becomes easier to shade and change or change the velocity, change the dynamics, change the texture, all these types of things in order to get from this side of the block to two blocks down across the street, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Do you find, do you find, because um, like, let's use uh, Brandon as an example, because you said you've worked with him a bunch in a lot of different kinds of contexts. Uh, we're listening to you guys play duo tonight. Um, when you work with someone like that, and obviously you guys have amazing rapport, you can, you can hear it from the first notes. It's like, you guys are, you're, you're together, you know, having that, that kind of, uh, you know, Brandon's 
bring in his his intensity, his attitude, his presence, all the things we talked about earlier uh, tonight. Um, when you know somebody like that, and as you say, you can kind of see the, the playing field, both through your own experience individually, but also the shared history you have with someone like Brandon. Um, do you find that in addition to like guiding the music and, and anticipating where it may go, that you also have more freedom to, let's say, make a jump, an unexpected move, to not necessarily go where the music seems to want to go, but to try to try to, uh, yeah, throw a curve into it. Or are you more more excited by the prospect of develop, the, developing the things in tandem and kind of anticipating and supporting where the music want to go uh, through its own through its own uh, trajectory? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I I I feel like I'm I'm happy to let the the follow the stream mm -hmm. most of the mm -hmm. time, but Roscoe Mitchell describe something that he calls ill rationality, you know? <laughs> so I guess, I, I guess that's a Midwestern thing, you know, cause it sounds familiar to me too. I'm, it's like in, in Michigan, we would say ill rational too. So <laughs> like, like it's, so the idea is, you know, anything can happen at any moment, you know, mm -hmm. literally an airplane could come crashing through this window, you know? It, mm -hmm. It's happened, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I I guess the answer is yes. I like I like both of them, but I like the idea of letting things kind of play out, on uh, not necessarily like you 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 tell students okay, just follow your ideas, let it play out, and then a lot of times with you know. Uh, younger players playing free what will happen is that the whole thing will go it'd be like they're following flying it goes down goes down goes down and then there's nothing and they gotta start over again mm -hmm. so i like the idea of following the thing but knowing when to jump ship i guess mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and keep it keep it moving like frogger across the road you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah you mentioned uh I've got another question from from a listener here, but before I get to that, I wanted to bring up one thing that you just brought up in this this incredible dichotomy, uh, this reference dichotomy. You talked about, you know, you've got the feeling of Billie Holiday in this moment, and then then maybe it goes to the cramps. Mm -hmm. and that's like a, those are like that's a big space. That's a that's a big frogger jump between these two kinds of aesthetics. But at the same time, I can totally hear the possibilities in that. Just you bringing up this kind of uh, you know, almost dialectic uh, expanse in it. Um, and, I, and that brings up a question I wanted to ask you. I mean, what other kinds of music outside of you, the music you've in general recorded that you perform that, uh, that have really big impact on you? Like, for example, you know, hearing the things that you've, you've played and, and knowing a little bit about your music, the Cramps wouldn't be a band that came up to mind right away, but the fact that you mentioned them, clearly there's something in there that maybe you like or maybe you want to push against. What other kinds of music have had impact on you and continue to influence the way you think? Oh, well, not to avoid your question, but uh, every everything. Um, I, I was lucky to grow up with a, a jazz drum and dad and uh, literally hearing the music from the womb, you mm -hmm. know. But the music that got me on the drums as a little kid was like am pop music. Oh, okay. You know, like Elton John and <laughs> and, and and Captain and Tennille and Wow Neil Diamond, you wow. know all and keep and keep it going all of that kind of stuff you know and then i discovered the beatles mm -hmm. and and then it was all over you know so i'm talking about i'm about eight i guess by this time and then you know my brothers and sisters are playing james brown and and sly and and then my older brothers is is playing freeform radio got the radio station on the freeform 
got the radio on the free swarm station. So I was hearing a whole lot of, and see, that's, that's something about Detroit. I don't know about Chicago, but Detroit, uh, like the, the up South people, I like to call them. They, they're, they're sophisticated, you know, like they, they, they have a broad palette. They listen to a bunch of stuff, you know, like, of course, back in the day, it was easier to, to get a whole bunch of crazy stuff on the radio. You know, mm-hmm. now, now you can't do it. So like, I, I, you know, like I grew up with the jazz, you know, I, I grew up with, with all of the, you know, and, and the still discovering rock stuff. Uh, big shout out to Michael Guarin and uh, my um, my tastes I just they just they they take me where they'll take me mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um, yeah. yeah yeah well it's a I think everybody that I know that's like let's say around our age and younger all the musicians I, I play with actually I should I shouldn't say our generation and younger, I should say everybody, because that include Joe McPhee in this statement. Everybody has unbelievable record libraries. Mm-hmm. They, they, they listen to such a huge range of music and all of those sources, all that information feeds back into the music they make. And it may not be overt, like, you know, I might not hear Elton John in, in the next piece, but the fact that all that's in there, these references that you can pull out are because there's like so much experience in listening. So the vocabulary that you've got on the drums, composer expands with all that information that's that's in your DNA, you know, growing up in that environment with all your family playing all that different kinds of music. I mean, that's that's so, that's really inspiring. And I think it comes out in the kinds of players that, that are around now. They're, they're not focused only on one kind of music. They're focused on all kinds of music and they see the the relationships between all these things yeah i tell you one other huge uh huge inspiration was um uh when i switched to music in my high school um i started taking lessons uh i was a trumpet player I, I i i was taking trumpet lessons from whatever 11th grade or something like that and i and i started being exposed to more and more like classical repertoire and that just that was a huge engine right there too you know um uh and and the other thing i wanted to say was watching 70s tv you know with the orchestras mm-hmm. that's what i wanted to do oh I, okay I want, I, but I wanted to do it my way. I guess I'm doing it right now. I just <laughs> wanted, I wanted to be versatile enough to sound like that. Well, what but, kind of, what kind of orchestra are you talk about? Like for like talk shows? I'm talking stuff? about like the TV, you know, like the TV shows and the mm-hmm. uh, any of the music you'd hear for TV shows. I wanted to be a part like of like a, C, a CBS stuff. studio orchestra. So. Oh yeah, okay, gotcha. You know. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, because I felt like those guys, they had to be quick on their feet, you know, <laughs> you know, and 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 I feel like even to this day, to to have a like that kind of se- sensibility at least, like a session sensibility, like go in and bam, mm-hmm. nail it. Not necessarily just about reading, but just nail it, mm-hmm. and on to the next. That's the way I, I feel like uh, that's that's sort of a, a small engine for me, you know, as mm-hmm. I like to play that game with myself. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that's a, a great reference. And and like you said, those, those studio musicians uh, historically going back to like, you know, the bands that did all the, you know, the, the orchestras that did all the stuff like, let's say, Frank Sinatra, the Nelson Riddle stuff. I mean, those musicians are extraordinary the amount of stuff that they could record you know read it down but not just the reading the, this almost immediate interpretation of those scores yeah I mean, yeah some really exactly stuff and they could just they could evoke it immediately they, right. they had the sensibility you're talking about so that translating into what you do when you go to a session or go to a gig you're like on spot bang that kind of it, it makes complete sense it's totally yeah. connected to that kind yeah. of ability 
Um, I got one more question. We'll go to some more music with you and Brandon. Uh, and this kind of connects to what we're talking about, so it's perfect. It's from Bis Biscuit Gecko. And um, they'd be curious to hear you uh, uh, speak a little bit about your recent album and the electronic elements in that recording. Okay. Um, wow. Well, uh, the, the biggest picture with that is right around, I don't know, 2012. I, I got it into my head that I really wanted to try and overcome this fear of, of electronics and, and uh, you know, because I, I, I have no need to plug anything up, you know. So it was just all a sort of a big mystery to me. You know, I loved the music, but I had no idea about the workings. So I started with um, a little bit of dibbling and dabbling uh, and then fast forward to 2015, 16 is when I got serious about it, bought Logic, bought Ableton and started just to teach myself a little bit uh, about that and start making music, um, uh, whatever came to mind, you know, given my limited, um, limited uh, abilities and resources because, you know, you, your computer is 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 the main ingredient right there so i i quickly ran out of out of ram and so that limited my my ability to create got a new computer and that helped and then around 2018 i discovered oh my wife recommended me this great modular modular synthesizer emulation this euro rack emulation called vcb rack which is free open source incredible um and that totally changed the game for me um it, it, yeah it's it's definitely worth looking at you know um for anybody because it's 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 intuitive all you need to know is uh, signal flow. You know, you want to get that, keep that signal flow going all the way to your speakers. And it, it, once you get into it, you'll see it's not that bad. So that just co co completely threw things, uh, set things on the on its ear, and and changed up my composition because I'm not a I'm not a pianist. I I play like bad arrangement piano. You know, I can play, I can play, you know, girl from Ipanema at quarter note equals 12, maybe. <laughs> so uh, having the, 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 the modular synth there really allowed me to start making some music immediately uh, and, and start crafting it and learning about the modules. Uh, just just learn I'm 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 I, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface with that stuff but, you know that's how it is with everything I guess you know yeah. but that does I hopefully that kind of answers a little bit yeah that's, that's, uh, that's and, and is this kind of a, a way of working that's going to run run with your ongoing projects is it a thing that you're you're pretty passionate about still yeah second record will be mixed this week wow uh, and it'll be out hopefully uh, early, early, tw early 2021. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. And what, la what label is going to be doing that? Uh, 577 Records. Okay. Federico, Federico Ugi okay. uh, runs that label, 577. Okay, great. Well, thanks to him. And, and that's fantastic that you're getting yeah. all this work done while we're, uh, while we're limited in the kinds of things we can do. I mean, it's Definitely. Yeah. Fantastic. It's sort of it's 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 completely suited because it's just me and the computer at this right. point. Right, 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 right. It's something you can really do, and you can realize it at the highest level right. in this context, which is which is incredible. Yeah. Here we have some more uh, music uh, to listen to. Uh, is this another completely improvised piece with you? It is. Yeah. Oh, great, great. Well, uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in. This is the Option Series, which happens every Monday night. Uh, thanks to Experimental Sound Studio based in Chicago, and ESS has been running the quarantine concerts for months. 
presenting musicians and music almost every day of the week. Huge thanks to them for all the support to the scene on an international basis. Uh, huge thanks to Gerald. Huge, huge thanks to, to Brandon Lopez. Let's listen to a little bit more music, and thanks for tuning in.
Hi, everybody. Uh, we've been listening to Gerald Cleaver and Brandon Lopez playing together and the rehearsal space that Gerald has in, uh, I guess, Brooklyn. Um, yeah, great material. Fantastic. Uh, right. And completely unlike the uh, first piece we heard. Mm. Um, things are moving along time-wise, and I don't want to keep you too late because I know you guys are an hour ahead of us uh, out east. But oh, I've got worry. a Okay, I've got a I've got a question from a listener. Again, this is from Ali Atori, and this one is: uh, Can you talk a little bit about the time and groove and feel of the piece we just heard? Are you thinking in terms of meter uh, at or delivery? Not thinking about meter. Um, I read that comment, or I, I read that question also what, mm -hmm. as as it, when it came in. So I started listening in that in that way. I, I'd say that um, uh, pulse is a better description about the way I think rather than meter. Sometimes I do think in meter, but it's rare, you know, um, not I don't mean <clears throat> that I am above thinking about meter. Mm -hmm. What I really mean is everything that is suggested. Um, and makes an impression on me is coming from a, a place of of phrasing and placement so if i go what comes next mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. oh yeah right. okay mm -hmm. you know so it just all depends on uh like if i hear i i'm not exactly sure how the the the, the meter feeling part of that happened i'd have to go back and check it out again to see who who initiated but i'm i'm guessing it was brandon i was hearing that tempo or one of those tempos in there or all of those tempos in there um because oh see that's the thing about brandon i hear about three four different things all at the same time which is useful you know uh uh, because I'm hearing as many things and trying to put all of them out at the same time, sort of float everything all at once, you know, so I can dip and, and dip and skip, you know, in between. But back to that question, I, when I'm in pulse, uh, I, I'm, I, I could think about meter but if i'm in meter i don't necessarily have to think about pulse so my definition of pulse is sort of the the least common denominator you know like i'll try and go down to the 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 most bass rhythm that allows something to still feel okay like for instance uh, to give you a quick example, so like at one point Brandon was playing like a line like do 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 about like in here, you know, which is not the pulse of me. The pulse, is, that's what I'm hearing. That's the phrase. Mm -hmm. So I can do anything in between that, including regular meter. Uh, but a pulse allows me to not have a beginning point or an ending pulse a beginning point or an ending point you know um you got yeah. a, good, a lot more freedom i mean you're, yeah. you're keeping the groove there but you can you can play a, so to speak across the bar because you're not worried about where the bar is going to line up every time exactly yeah uh, definitely uh, it's, uh, yeah it's fantastic um i i have a question you, you kind of hinted at it a little bit uh in uh, one of the other parts of the conversation we've been having. And I, I'm fascinated by the developments in the Midwest, in the music, uh, starting in the late 60s, going into the 70s, as compared to what was maybe loosely understood as the, the Coltrane, you know, free jazz, uh, Ornette Coleman, Cecil Taylor, you know, Shep, all the stuff that was kind of coming out of the... The Northeast, you know, based, let's say, around Manhattan, 
uh, with musicians coming through there or being based there, whatnot. Uh, the things that the ACM developed, a uh, black artist group developed in uh, St. Louis. And unfortunately, I've got giant gaps in, in the knowledge or lack of knowledge, I should say, uh, that I have about Detroit. And I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about, like, I think something I, I, I got to talk to a little bit with Roscoe Mitchell about it. I'm fascinated that such different aesthetics developed out here away from where New York and all that was happening and how people arrived at the ideas they did. And I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about the impact of that history, particularly coming out of that period, like the late 60s and the 70s, going forward from there, how those musicians based in Detroit affected, A, the music in a broader sense, but especially for you, and what you learned there, uh, what affected you when you got to New York and, and now being based in the New York area, what you brought from Detroit in terms of aesthetics, in terms of like approach to the music. Like I know speaking personally, I grew up in, in, in the Boston area and what I learned in Boston came with me to Chicago. It really affected the way I thought about things. And then I was presented with the situation in Chicago and my my background was based in people like Joe Morris, who we both worked with, and seeing Joe play, coming up as a musician, and the other other musicians like groups like the Fringe and and uh, whatnot, and all the musicians based there, they affected my thinking when I came to Chicago. Was that something similar for you that you had these roots in Detroit, uh, that period maybe as well, and what what you, what you brought to New York with you from that or how do, you, how do you feel about that, or how do you think about that? Well, uh, just to, to go back, um, I can remember the 60s. You know, I was a little kid, but I, can, I, I have a feeling about what, what that time was or what, what, a, what a period is like for a kid is always going to be different than reality, first of all. But I have to say that my experience of the 60s was was as good as drugs because I was a little kid and, you know, the, the chemicals are raging through kids anyway. So I was essentially I was a young drug addict. Yes, it's true. My name is Gerald. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. Um, uh, the. The 70s, uh, I definitely can remember, and if and the the thing that popped out to me immediately as you were speaking was self determination. You know, uh, black folk all over the place, especially the 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 the, the, the people who came up that the upwardly what do you call it the great migration you know the all of those people uh were um very determined you know they had they had uh won the civil rights battle you know they they won uh uh, uh vote they won the voting rights you know they got they got industry to pay attention you know, there were what people call quotas or whatever, but I, I won't even get into that. So I, what, I, what I'm really getting at is there was a feeling that black people could attain and achieve something through collective effort. And uh, I can remember that as a kid. For instance, the, the, the organization that parallels the art, uh, the uh, art ensemble. I mean, the, uh, the uh, AACM is Strata. Oh, right, right, Strata. In Detroit, uh, who that was that was founded by Marcus Belgrave, Phil Randlin, Wendell Harrison, some other people I don't remember, uh, and then and even uh, another incarnation is the Creative Arts Collective, that with uh, A. Spencer Bearfield, Dre Bushahi. Tiny Tabal, um, you know, Farouk Zibe, Anthony Holland, all these great people. So uh, their rents were 
super cheap. They're st still, they're even cheaper now. You know, uh, there was there was plenty of work available. People were able to be creative. You know, they didn't the 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 man's foot was not on their neck. You know. In, in the sense that they, they, they had the freedom to create, there were places to play, you know. So um, that feeling, I took that feeling to, to New York with me. And I was a little surprised actually when I got to New York and it wasn't like Detroit, you know, that people were um, segmented, you know, and, and that people, there weren't people, there weren't many, many people who did everything or wanted to do everything. You know, mm -hmm. or everything that I thought that they should be doing, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, yeah, it's a little rambly, but does that answer? No, no not, not rambly at all. That's like a ton of history in a very small amount of time. Yeah. And clearly there was a lot of impact, you know, from what you grew up in, that environment, the point of self-determination, which definitely... Uh, I connect with the artists from the ACM and the Black Artists Group and the people you're mentioning coming out of Detroit as well. I mean, that's so key, period, you mm -hmm. know, and, mm -hmm. and to carry that, like having that presence in your life, seeing the examples and experiencing the examples of that right around you, not reading about it in a book or reading the liner notes on a record, but like that was your environment. You know, that's an incredible thing to grow up in and then and then to bring it to another place mm -hmm. to share well in the New York area. That's how this stuff grows is this, you know, developing new communities, sharing information and, and resources. So, yeah, that answers the question in the best way possible. Um, I think what I'd like to do is conclude with some more of your music. Okay. Uh, Talking with you has been phenomenal, <laughs> and I wish the show was like a lot longer. <laughs> but yeah. I have to figure out a, a way to get you back and and uh, and hearing you, man. I, I speaking really hope that we get a chance to play I, together. I do too. Yeah. Uh, that would yeah. be so exciting, and and uh, it's another reason to get through this period that we're in right now. And and uh, you know, keep safe, keep keep doing what you're doing. Good luck with the new recording projects that are coming up. Thanks. Um, Man, just phenomenally inspiring to be uh, have this evening with you, and uh, and to hear Brandon play some more. Uh, speaking of bass players, next week uh, Jean Hebert is going to be the guest. Uh, Tim Daisy will be interviewing him. I think the music will be solo bass uh, performances. So please tune in at 8 p.m. Central Time uh, for the next edition of Option. Huge thanks, Gerald. It's, it's yeah, thank you, Ken. Talk yeah. to you and the music and and hear the history. And I look forward to seeing you really soon. We're going to close out with some more duo music with uh, Gerald Cleaver and uh, Brenda Lopez. Huge thanks to Sam Clapp doing all the technical work tonight. Thanks, As Sam. always, yes. And uh, I look forward to the next time, Gerald. Take care, man. All right, Ken. Take care. Take care. Beautiful to see you. See you. Thank you.